Welcome back to the IDP Show Rankings episode. I'm your host, Jace Abbey, and I'm here to bring you the highlights of my rankings for week 15. Regular listeners and viewers will know what we do by now, but for anyone new, we'll be going position by position, highlighting players we are either hyping or fading for the slate of games ahead. I am joined today by a man who needs no introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Uh, he's the staff writer at Football Guys, author of weekly IDP articles, The Guru's Notepad, and The Eyes of the Guru. Welcome to the show, John Norton. John, thanks for coming on, dude. Thank you How for having you? me. Thank you for having me. Doing well. Been looking forward to it. Same, same, and then some. Uh, getting excited about these uh, these fantasy playoffs? Oh, absolutely. Playoff time, the end of the year. It's, uh, it's what we've worked for. I've been doing this stuff and starting back in right after the draft, actually. And we start right and start working on things, building our teams, building our our uh, plans and all that in May. So it's kind of the culmination of all that. So it's pretty exciting to get here. Had pretty good luck this year. Made it in the, in the playoffs in most of my leagues. So all is well. Looking forward to the weekend. I would expect no less. Uh, I can't wait. I'll, I'll no doubt crash and burn in these leagues where I've been the highest scorer all year. Um, but hopefully in a couple of the other ones, I'll uh, I'll come good and win a, win a fantasy championship or two, but who knows. So look, should we talk about some of these players who we think are going to make or break uh, these fantasy teams in the playoffs in week 15? Do you want to kick us off with your featured linebacker who you think is going to have a big game this week? Sure. Yeah, so the guy that I'm counting on to win me some championships or at least take me to the next round uh, this week is Logan Wilson from the Bengals uh, against the Minnesota Vikings. You know, the Vikings uh, prior to the loss of Kirk Cousins for a, not a great, a great matchup for linebackers. They were throwing the ball a lot. They were a better matchup for corners and defensive backs. Uh, since Cousins went down, they, they turned to more of a, a run oriented attack. Uh, they, their numbers have jumped exponentially uh, as far as linebacker matchups go, uh, over the last seven or eight weeks, they're they're giving up 31 points per game to linebackers to off-ball linebackers. Uh, that's a, like 13.6 solo tackles, 6.6 assists, and quite a few splash plays. You know, starting back at week seven, we've seen Fred Warner seven tackles, six assists, and a pass defended. Dre Greenlaw eight two. Quay Walker seven three and a pass defended. Devondre Campbell ten four. Uh, Nate Landman five five with a sack. Uh, Mario Davis six three with a sack. Timothy Jewell five one with a fumble recovery. Alex Singleton eleven five. Tremaine Edmonds five two and a forced fumble. Uh, T.J. Edwards, six tackles and an interception. Last week, Robert Spillane, 7-3, uh, sack. Well, the, you notice that the last several games, the big play numbers, splash play numbers have really jumped, but the tackle numbers have been real consistent. Uh, one of the things that I really like about Wilson this week is kind of a no-miss. Uh, the floor is very high, and the ceiling has the potential to be top five. I've got him ranked in my top five this week as well. Top five. That's um, that's 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 tasty. I've I've gone down at LB fourteen, but um, that's uh, uh, you make a good case. Um, the Vikings, like you say, they're a, they're a great matchup, uh, and Wilson has been been consistent. A bit unlucky last week, I think, with the uh, assisted tackles. Um, but uh, yeah. depending on how you score them in your league, he might have still scored well. But um, no, good call. I like it. Sometimes your stat crews bite you a little bit on stuff like that too, and. He's got another good linebacker that, that he's competing with for tackles and Jermaine Pratt. So those guys kind of take turns. And mm -hmm. I actually like both of those guys quite a bit this week. I think there's going to be plenty to go around for both of them to put up good numbers for us. Yeah, I, I actually considered Pratt for uh, my featured linebacker in this spot for many of the same reasons as you talked about. I actually quite like um, some of the matchups for quite a few guys this week that I would ordinarily have in my top 20. And uh, Wilson's definitely one of them. Um, Pratt's just outside my top twenty this week, but um, I like him too for the for the same reasons. But the featured linebacker I've gone with is uh, Tremaine Edmonds. Uh, he's my LB twenty two this week. You know, as we know, he's been a bit overshadowed by his his teammate TJ Edwards this year. Edwards has the the superior tackle efficiency, and unlike Edmonds, crucially, Edwards has has stayed healthy all year. You know, Edmonds on the other hand has. Has missed two games, uh, which has been a been a bit of a problem. 
uh, and he's had a smaller role in two or three more games because of nagging injury issues. But he's off the injury report, healthy and, and ready to remind us just how productive he can be. And I think he has a good chance uh, to prove his value to fantasy managers this weekend against the uh, the Browns, who we know, thanks to uh, Mr. Macri's wonderful charts on, on X, have allowed the second most tackles to opposition linebackers this year. Where do you where do you stand on Edmonds, John? I think he's a solid play, definitely a, a high floor play. Uh, I'm not so so sure that I, I like his upside necessarily against Cleveland as far as big plays and stuff like that, but uh, definitely a steady solid producer. I've got him projected at right around 13 points this week, which is right on the cusp of the top 20, top 25 or so. I do more projections than I do actual rankings. So I, I kind of look at the numbers that way rather than listing them sometimes. But uh, I, mm-hmm. when I put them up on the site, you can go to football guys and see uh, what my rankings are and, and we'll put them in the rankings according to the way I have them all projected. I, I definitely like him this week. I, I don't think you can go wrong with him at all. Uh, a little less excited about the upside than you are, I think. But uh, I can't argue with the pick. Fair enough, fair enough. The contract for me, certainly when compared with the contract for Edwards, there's a lesson to be learned there for all teams, I think, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. Just because you're making a lot of money doesn't make you a good player. That's it, exactly. So let's talk um, briefly about a couple of other linebackers who we think could help us this weekend. Hit me with a few more names, John. Nah, I got uh, Jeremiah awusu Koromoa uh, against the Bears this week. Uh Chicago is another team that's done a massive turnaround since early in the season. They were struggling greatly in the first six, seven weeks. Uh, you couldn't really start anybody about them against them if we were counting on tackles. That's pretty much come around over the last several games. They've uh, been a, an outstanding matchup for linebackers. Uh Koromura, another situation where Cleveland early in the season, you couldn't really start any of those guys. You didn't know who was going to see the most playing time. You didn't know if any of them were going to be productive. It's still been somewhat of a crapshoot, but at least he's come on, come on and put up double-digit scores for us in uh, I think five of the last six games or something like that. Had a really nice game a couple weeks ago, uh, and I just I see him kind of settling into that lead role for the for the Browns and putting up some good numbers this week. I really like his his opportunity and his chances of making a splash play to go along with some pretty decent tackle numbers. Another guy I like is Ernest Jones uh, versus Washington. Uh, Jones has double-digit points of 10 of 12 games this year, and, and he, he's done a lot of that with some lesser-quality matchups, uh, he, but he, that makes him a virtually no-risk play. Uh, the guy's not going to give you a zero. He, one of the things that I really hate this time of year is when you put a guy in there and you take a little bit of a chance on him and he gives you nothing. Uh, yeah, I, I can stand a guy having an average game. I can't stand a guy that does nothing for a game. Now, I don't think we have anything to worry about with Jones. He has very little competition for tackles. There's no other linebackers there. Uh, the safeties, you know, they've got to get past him to get to the safeties for the most point. And right now, the commanders uh, are giving up 32 points a game to linebackers, makes them the best matchup in the game for the position you know, over the last eight weeks. Yeah, I like both both names. I talked about Jones last week. I think he might have even been my featured guy. Um, but yeah, I like both both players. It's, uh, with Awusu Koromo, it's nice to see him playing, like like you said, a little more in recent times than he was playing earlier in the year, kind of separating himself from that from that pack. And you know, by and large, he's actually playing playing well, which gives me some confidence that that snap share that he's seen in recent games is is likely to continue. I like the fact that they finally settled settled on somebody, and somebody is starting to stand out. You know, for like I said, for several games there early in the season. In a week to week, it was a different guy putting up the most points. At least we finally know yeah. the one guy to target on that defense. We finally at least they have somebody to concentrate on. Yeah, and it's just another name in the in the pool, isn't it? Of uh, of guys who are playing at least you know eighty ninety percent of snaps, which uh, was was pretty thin at times in the season, especially during those weeks where we had six teams on a on a buy. Oh. So yeah, I, oh, yes. I really like Coromel. I really liked him in his rookie year, and I really wanted to see more from him. In his sophomore year, I was a bit disappointed. So, yeah, it's nice to see him bounce back a little bit in his uh, in his third year, and hopefully that continues. So, yeah, I'll add to to your fine list with uh, Alandon Roberts. We don't 
like to read too much into tackle efficiency because we know that can vary greatly from one game to the next. But I'd be remiss not to mention that Roberts leads all linebackers in that category, one spot ahead of uh, Zaire Franklin, actually, with an impressive figure of 16.8%. His tackle numbers have been down a bit in the last three weeks, but uh, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. A combination of the fact that he missed most of that Cardinals game back in week 13, I think it was, and the Steelers just haven't played many defensive snaps. I think 100 uh, in the other two games combined. Um, I think he can bounce back this weekend against the Colts. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm plugging him in where I've got him. The second guy I want to mention here is Alex Singleton. He's a guy who proved me very wrong last week. I talked about him as a player that I was looking to fade against what should have been a poor matchup versus the Chargers. In his last four games, two sacks, two pass breakups, 50 tackles, 50 tackles. That that leads all linebackers in that category over that span. The Lions, they're kind of a middle-of-the-road matchup for linebackers this year, but I think it would take a brave person to bet against Singleton having another strong game this week. That's a guy that it doesn't matter who the matchup is. The guy just, he always is going to put up good numbers for you. I, I don't know why so many teams... Tried every every time he goes to a team, he winds up starting a few games. He puts up great numbers. He plays looks like he plays well from from what I see. I don't know what the coaches are looking for, but it seems like they're always trying to find a reason to bench him or replace him. Or he's a magnet. He's a ball magnet. He, he I don't care if he makes plays three or four that yards down the field. He just makes a ton of tackles no matter where he is or what the situation is or who the matchup is. So hard to go wrong with him. I mean, he's a matchup proof player as far as I'm concerned. Uh huh. And and. You know, we talked about, or I talked about how tackle efficiency can be volatile. But in his case, as you alluded to there, he's he's been doing it. He's, he's been one of the best linebackers in terms of tackle efficiency for what seems like about two or three seasons now, wherever he's been playing. Um, he's kind of scheme diverse in that sense. It's, it's, been, it's been pretty cool to see. With the land and Robert, Pittsburgh doesn't seem to want to settle and give anybody consistently give them full-time playing time. Uh, you know, he, he's yeah. getting 80, 85 percent of the snaps at most, and then the next week he might get 70 percent, or sometimes even less. So that's a little bit volatile, but he makes he makes up for it with a lot of big plays, a lot of splash plays. And uh, at this point, with a lot of their injuries that they've got there, he's definitely their lead man. If he gets enough opportunity, uh, he he could definitely be a pleasant surprise. Yeah, hopefully they play more than the sort of 40, 50 snaps they've been playing in in recent games on on defense. That would be. Uh... That's pretty key, I think, for him to perform um, at the level that we'd like to see him at. That defense is always good about getting off the field. And you go back five years, ten years, three years, and you look at the snap counts and how many offensive plays they faced. And the Steelers are always near the bottom of the league in the number of, of offensive snaps that they faced. And that it makes those guys you know, more opportunity the better you the more chance you're going to have a put up good numbers. You start taking away 100, 100 snaps from a player, it's hard for him to be put him on the same level with some of the better guys. If he got enough playing time, I think he'd be right up there with some of the best. So linebackers we don't like. Um, who, are you, who are you fading, John? Who's your featured guy here? So the one guy that I'm definitely fading hard is, is Zach Cunningham. A couple of reasons. Playing time is one of them. You know, we're, we're not sure what they've got going on there. He was down to like 74, 75% of the snaps this past week while they're, they're introducing uh, Shaq Leonard in there a little bit. He got a few snaps. I don't know how much of that had to do with the lopsided score. If they pulled him off at the end, I wasn't really paying that close of attention. That rate when the score was so lopsided if they pulled some of those guys out. Uh, he's definitely a guy that's not guaranteed to play 90% of the snaps every week. So he's kind of up and down on that part of it. Uh, Seattle was a horrible matchup. That's the key reason that I have him in here. Uh, some very good linebackers have been far from, from productive against them. We've seen Fred Warner has seven tackles and seven assists in two games against them. Uh, Dre Greenwald has seven tackles and five assists in two games against them. Damone Clark, two tackles, two assists. Marquise Paul, 4-4. Four, four. Patrick Queen was 5-1. Roquan Smith, 3-2. Azir White, 3-2. Uh, all age of men, uh, Jim, Jim and Davis has more than five solos against Seattle over the past two months. Uh, Seattle's struggling to, to move the ball. They got their, their running backs are beat up. Uh, and when they do do it, they move it, they throw it a lot. So uh, 
I just don't see Cunningham being a guy that can overcome all of those and put up really good numbers for us this week. Yeah, agreed. I think even before Shaq Leonard's arrival, he was he was struggling to separate from from Nicholas Morrow, and that tells its own story. As you as you said, Leonard only had a, a small role, but yeah, if it's going to go anywhere, it's going to increase. Um, so the guy I've gone with here, the guy I want to nominate is is Pete Werner. Um, he's been a for me, he's been a huge disappointment this year. Uh, we came into the season expecting bigger things. Um, not sure I'd go as far as to say big things, but certainly bigger things. You know, this this could have been the year that he emerged from the shadow of Demario Davis. Uh, and things looked pretty promising, didn't they, for the first month or so? Um, but since then, it's gone from bad to worse. He's had just two games with seven or more tackles. No big plays to speak of. And his performances have left a lot to be desired as well. Um, even if we overlook the reduced snap share last week, using the excuse that he was being eased back in after that oblique injury, he's just not someone who I want to rely on as we head into the fantasy playoffs, especially when he's got the Giants this week who allowed far fewer tackles to opposition linebackers since DeVito has took over at quarterback. So, yeah, I'm, I'm out on him. What say you, John? Are you still holding out hope for Werner this season? Now, I am hugely disappointed at Pete Werner. He was a guy going into this season that I expected to take over the lead role there. You know, you've got uh, Mario Davis, who's 80 years old or so, still at this point playing better. I mean, Werner looked great down the stretch last year. He was really starting to come on. He was a guy that, that I drafted very highly. A couple of weeks I drafted, he was my LB2. Uh, that's been a major disappointment. And I can't put my finger on what's going on there. For the most part, he's seeing the playing time. So it's not a case of him not having the opportunity. He's just not making the plays. I know we've got a new coaching staff or different coaching staff in there defensively, so the defense has kind of changed up. But uh, I don't know if they're just misusing him or what what's going on on the inside there. But, yeah, the, he, he's been a major disappointment. Any other linebackers you don't like the look of for Week 15? Uh, C.J. Mosley has been a disappointment for me uh, just over the last month. He was putting up great yeah. numbers early in the season, and it's all of a sudden somebody flipped the switch off. Uh, you know, the, the Dolphins are a mediocre matchup, but this one's way more about the player. Simply put, I don't trust him in a must-win game with the numbers that he's given us in the three of the last four games. Uh, I love the player. I got several shares of him across my leagues that the guys just absolutely killed me down the stretch. He has six or fewer points in three of the last four games, uh, three tackles and six assists in the last over total in the last two games. And, you know, even if you hit a top 10 matchup, I might have to, to roll with him again, but Miami being middle of the pack, I, I'm just, I'm out on mostly for this week. Uh, another guy that I don't like, and this one is 100% based on matchup, is Kenneth Murray. Murray's a guy that early in his career, I was pretty high on him. Uh, and then he kind of stunk, and I kind of shoved him off with one of those guys that you get burned by, so you kind of go away from them and they get in your doghouse. But he's put up good numbers this, this year, you know, 9 3 1 last week. So it was kind of hard to be down on a guy that put up nine tackles, three assists, and the sacks the previous week. But the Raiders were a bad matchup, uh, even when they had healthy running backs. Now, uh, with, uh, with the running backs banged up there, they're, they're on the backups. Uh, they were middle of the pack at best, even with Jacobs in there. I just don't think there's going to be a whole lot of opportunity. Uh, you get the battle with the backup quarterbacks going here. You know, we've got a team that will generate three to nothing game last week, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if this one ends up being another three to nothing type game. Uh, it was just, just not a lot of opportunity for a linebacker to make plays. Murray's best chance at a good week is is a big play, a splash play, which he's been able to do on occasion this year, he but has. it's not something you want to go into a week relying on happening. It's just not something that's, that's easily predicted, is it? Splash plays are a bonus when you're, with, when you're talking about linebackers. You need those guys to be the, the foundation of your defense, and they're the running back of your defense. You need them to put up consistent numbers for and go for the consistency over the big plays. And if you get a splash play, that's just a feather in your hat. You said it. So for me, no great surprises here, but Jack Campbell is someone I recommend people uh, leave on their bench this week. It looked like he might have a chance to show he deserved a bigger role in Anzalone's absence. Um, but Anzalone came back a little earlier than, than we expected. 
Um, and then immediately we gained his full-time role, leaving Campbell kind of fighting for scraps behind uh, even Derek Barnes. So yeah, he's a guy who I don't think many would would be starting anyway, but avoid temptation if you can. Ronnie Harrison is my is my second fade. Uh, he played every down last week, but you know four tackles had that interception as well. But EJ Speed looks like he's he's close to returning. He was listed as a a full participant, I think, in in Tuesday's walkthrough. So unless Speed suffers a setback, I can't imagine a scenario where Ronnie Harrison sees anywhere even close to the snap share he had last week. And without that opportunity, you know, what can he do? So yeah, those two guys are, uh, are big fades for me this week. Um, Campbell maybe as an LB4 in those weeks where you've got a lot of teams on a buy and you're kind of scrabbling to find linebackers who are going to play. But this is not one of those weeks. Yeah, I, w- I would be in agreement with John Campbell. He, Campbell's a guy that I love for the future. If you're in dynasty leagues and you can get mm-hmm. your hand on this guy, I think he's going to be an absolute stud for us down the road. We've seen a lot of, in, in recent years, a lot of times where they uh, teams have spent a high draft pick or, or a lot of capital on a player, a young player, and they kind of like we used to see, with, or we still see with quarterbacks. They'll set them on the bench behind the starters. They'll give them a little bit of playing time, ease them in, you know, get their feet wet, and then that second year they come out. Uh, I could sit here and name off a handful of guys that have been in that situation. Logan Wilson being the one being some from Cincinnati that stands out to me. Uh, didn't play much as a rookie, about the same kind of role that Campbell had and come out, and he's been a pretty solid player ever since. I'm like, oh, yeah, back back to the 50, 59, 60% playing time. It's hard to, to put up consistent numbers with that kind of playing time right now. They're using him as the third linebacker. He did start last week ahead of, ahead of Barnes, but uh, – at the end of the game, Barnes had 87% of the snaps and Campbell had 59% of the snaps. Like the player situation for next year, but not for this week when you need to win it. Can't argue with the Ronnie Harrison situation. That was kind of a one-week thing. Most people didn't even realize that he was going to wind up getting the playing time. Kind of disappointed in the side, but the tackle totals that he put up. But yeah, I think he could be a good fit as a weak side linebacker somewhere. So maybe he'll turn up again somewhere or wind up being a steady backup there. And speeds back, practiced in full early this week. Uh, no, there's no reason to see Harris, Harrison on the field. No, no, there's not. Um, all right, so on to the uh, defensive line. John, who do you who do you like here? Who's your feature guy here? So my feature guy this week is Carl Granderson. Uh, another situation where we've got a guy that he doesn't make a ton of sacks, but if you get him a good matchup, he tends to show up in the sack column for you. The Giants are a great matchup, giving up a ton of sacks. Uh, you know, but my thing is there, there's nothing worse than taking a zero from one of your defensive players. If I'm going to take a zero from somebody, it's going to be a cornerback or somebody that I'm going to gamble with. I'm, I'm going to go with the defensive lineman that I can count on to make at least a few tackles. And Granderson is one of those guys. Uh, He's on pace right now for 47 tackles and 36 assists. That means he's got a high floor and virtually no chance of a goose egg. Uh, on the high side, it's hard to beat the matchup with the Giants, who've given up an average of five sacks per game since week seven and have allowed a whopping 19 to the edge position over their last seven outing. Granderson, uh, I have Granderson projected for five combined tackles on the sack and a half, and about half a turnover on my projections. Um, you can't get half a turnover, but yeah, you know, I, I think there'll be another splash play, a sack, forced fumble, recovery, something along those lines, a couple batted passes or something there. But I think he stands out this week. And even if he doesn't make those those kind of plays, you, know, you can count on him for four or five tackles, three or four or so, on a couple of assists at the very least. And I think we'll get a lot more than that out of him with this matchup. Yeah, there's a couple of uh, offensive uh, lines that I look at each week when I'm working out who has the best <laughs> matchups, the Giants, the Jets um, towards the the latter half of what we've so what we've seen so far this year, uh, Carolina recently as well, and of, of course Washington. Washington, um, yep. Those yeah. are the four. Yeah. Yep. Trying yeah. to figure out who to yeah. pick up, look and see who's available. That's on the team that's playing against one of those four. And that's the guy you put in your lineup that week. If I had to pick a, a fifth offensive line, who I think's pretty weak or pretty weak of late, it would be the the Texans, and uh, it's for that reason that I've gone with. My first nomination uh, of a defensive lineman who I like this week is Harold Landry. Um, he was he was really quiet for the first five games, but he's really come alive in the last eight. 
uh, eight sacks over that period, including three last weekend against the Dolphins, who typically don't give up many sacks at all. I'm not Landry's biggest fan, if I'm honest. He's one of those guys for me that's always needed a lot of volume to produce, um, but it's hard to ignore the kind of production that we, we've seen lately. And there's a good chance he can continue that hot streak against against that Texans offensive line. Like I say, they've allowed 62 pressures in the last four games and the second most sacks of any team over that span. I was kind of struggling to find a place for Landry in my top 75 defensive linemen going back, you know, about six weeks ago. Um, but after his recent form uh, and for this week, um, with that good matchup, I moved him into sort of edge three territory. Um, is there anything you'd like to add on on Landry, John? Yeah, you know, Landry is a guy that I've been very high on for the last couple of years. He, he's had a lot of injury issues that have, that have slowed him down. And, and uh, I think that was a lot of his problem early this year. But this is a guy that I targeted. It, a lot of the leagues that I'm in, I have him now because other people gave up on him early in the season and were letting him go. And I'm just picking him up and stashing him on my roster. And here, like you said, lately he's really been coming on. Not he, he gets the volume of snaps. Now, he's a guy that puts up a lot of tackles. And if you notice that theme for me is I, I like guys that make tackles. You know, I'll take the splash plays and the sacks and all that. That's all great. But give me a guy that I can count on to score some points for me every week, and that'll make me happy. Now, Landry was actually a guy that I had considered strongly for one of my three guys to talk about. I mean, he very narrowly missed making the list. Interesting you should say that because Grandison was one of mine. Um, <laughs> I made a short list of maybe three or four guys I wanted to talk about. And Grandison, Landry, I forget the other two. Um, yeah. oh, the other two are in my uh, my my next two to talk about uh, in, the, in the brief quick hitters section. So, yeah, glad you glad you agree. Um, so, who who else are you championing on the defensive line this week? You know, you talk about those matchups, and that's basically where I'm going here. I got uh, Andrew Van Ginkel against the Jets. Uh, kind of the same approach that led me to Van Ginkel, that led me to Granderson. His floor is a little lower than Granderson because he, he has a tendency to put up not as many tackles, uh, but the guy has huge, huge splash play potential on any given week, regardless of the matchup. Uh, he kind of been out of sight for a lot of people because he really wasn't a starter in Miami. Uh, he made a few starts early in the season, put up some good numbers. You know, and then they got uh, Jalen Phillips back, so Van Geekel kind of went back on the shelf as the third guy in there. And he would show up now and then, but not with any consistency. And you know, now that Phillips is on injured reserve, uh, Van Geekel's back in the starting role. Uh, and we've already talked about what a great matchup the Jets are. Well, uh, I think he, he uh, makes an impact this week. Um, the other guy that I'll talk about uh, is Michael Hope uh, against Washington. One easy way to identify a high potential defensive lineman simply to see who the commanders are playing this week. That puts so high on my list. Uh, this is another guy that makes a lot of tackles, so his floor is high. He only has four and a half sacks on the season, but four of those have come over the last seven games. So he's kind of coming around in that area as well. This is a guy that when he first, they first moved him out to defensive end, he was, had been a defensive tackle and was ch checking in at about 315 pounds. He's cut quite a bit of the weight off, picked up some speed. He, he definitely improved as a pass rusher. And I don't think he's a guy that's ever going to challenge for a sack title, but he will contribute one now and then, especially when you get a great matchup like this. So, uh, I think he uh, he has an opportunity to stand out this week. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely counting on four or five solid tackles, and I would not be at all surprised if he gets us a sack. Yeah, Hecht is also one of those guys that plays a, a pretty huge snap volume yes. uh, his share yeah. is, is is larger than most um, he, you know most most of these edge guys we're looking at you know 60 to 70 75 hect is one of those guys is in that sort of in that 75 to, to 90 and even north of that sometimes so he's that about an 85 his, consistently yeah. an 85 percent snap count guy um so i've gone with uh van ginkle's uh teammate uh the guy on the other side of that uh defensive line so bradley chubb with my next choice he's He's failed to record a sack since, uh, I think, week nine. But I think he's been unfortunate not to after racking up 20 pressures in that time. He's tied for ninth amongst all D linemen in that category over that period. Um, if we're talking about him being unlucky, especially last week, he he looked really disruptive against the 
I want to say the Titans. It was a Titans, wasn't it? He had two QB hits, yeah, seven hurries. Yeah, should have had a sack, really. Um, I think he's got a pretty good chance to produce if he can perform anywhere near as well this week uh, as he did last week. Uh, and for all the reasons you mentioned as well, the matchup is is pretty nice. Zach Allen is the next guy I want to talk about. He's quietly gone from sort of strength to strength as the season's unfolded. Uh, already surpassed his career high in sacks with seven, and his pressure rate is the, the best of his career. In fact, he ranks ninth amongst all interior and edge players in pressures over the last month, which surprised me a little bit when I saw. Um, his tackle numbers have dipped in recent games, yes. We can forgive him for that, I think, if he continues to get after the quarterback in the way that he has done. The matchup's not amazing. The Lions haven't surrendered many sacks this year at all, but they haven't been quite as good at protecting Goff in recent games. So I think Allen and that Broncos D as a whole could could make an impact in this game. And I think they might be meeting the Lions at the right time in the year. Allen's definitely a guy that I like, uh, especially if you're in a, in a league that requires defensive tackles and is an interior guy. He's a guy that, uh, back to that theme again, you, you can count on him to make plays for you every week. He's not going to give you a goose egg regardless of the matchup. Uh, he, he's a solid inside pass rusher. Uh, I don't think you can go wrong with that pick. He's a guy that I've got in several leagues and will be starting in every month that I have him this week. So I definitely like him. Uh, Chubb, you know, the, one of the things that you, if you see a guy that's getting pressures and getting pressures, and, and he seemed like he was, every time there was a play, he was in the picture at the end of the play last week. But he just didn't quite, wasn't the guy that got there. Uh, and everything was credited to somebody else. But yeah, I'm in full agreement that those things will come. And had I not gone with Stan Geekle, I would have probably gone with Chubb based on the matchup. So I don't think you can go wrong with either of those guys. Yeah. On the Van Ginkle one, I, I, I will say I'm loving his his story. I love an underdog story anyway. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, like you say, it wasn't, wasn't projected to be the starter. It kind of played that sort of tweener role, linebacker edge after Phillips came back. But it's nice to see him go from being productive when he was an edge rusher before before Phillips returned to going back to being productive again as an edge rusher now that Phillips is out again. So, yeah, I, I, I pull for him every week. I talked him up last week. I would probably have him on my list somewhere, maybe as my featured guy, if uh, if I didn't talk about him just last week. So I try and mix it up a little bit. So, yep. yeah, right there with you on Van Ginkle. Uh, so knows I don't yeah. like... All right, so uh, uh, Miles Garrett, and I would have, if you would have asked me you know, a month or two months ago, I would never have dreamed that I would be saying that I didn't like Miles Garrett versus anybody. Uh, but he's obviously playing hurt. Uh, he's been banged up all year long with a variety of injuries, and they finally taken their toll on the shoulder injury that he's been playing through. He's still playing 80% plus of the snaps, but he's just not as effective as he was. Uh, like at the last three games, he has no sacks. Uh, he's uh, what, got three tackles and two assists with one batted pass uh, over the last three games. He had 13 sacks in the first 10 games, and now all of a sudden it's just like he's he's neutralized. And uh, you know, when you do a player like that in the sit in position like that with a sore shoulder, you got to protect that shoulder. They're not going to be as aggressive as they would be. It, it's just matchup is not as good as you would think either. In Chicago, the first six games, Chicago was given up sacks by the basket school. Uh, they have not been that team recently. I think they're, they're giving up a little bit less than two sacks per game on average uh, since week seven. So the matchup is not as great as it once was. Uh, the players banged up. The Browns are struggling. They, they're, if you look at their defense and the injuries they've got, they've got like half of their starters could possibly be on the sideline this weekend. Um, and I just I don't see Garrett being able to overcome that. You know, the shoulder starts getting better, uh, maybe down the stretch or in the playoffs or whatever. But until we until we see the same Miles Garrett that we drafted back before the season, and he's going to stay on my bench. Yeah, it's an interesting one that um, because uh, yeah, I thought he looked like he was playing injured too, but that was for me that was more so in week thirteen against um, the uh, the Rams and. I thought he actually looked more like himself last week and was a little unlucky not to get a sack. So I just wonder whether they continue to play him in, in knowing that he was going to become healthy over the course of a couple of weeks and, and whether last week was 
a glimmer of hope for what what we might see going forward. Maybe this is just this is me hoping because I've got him on a bunch of my playoff teams and I I need him back this week. So it's we'll it's hard to, to bench a guy like that when you, the guy when you drafted him as high as you did and you know that what he's capable of. But like I said, I I I would not be willing to risk taking a one tackle or a no tackle game in a playoff game. Yeah, I, he, he may maybe this was the week that he comes out of it and he kind of gets back to to himself. Uh, I can't take that risk in the playoffs. I got I better put somebody in there unless I have nobody else. If you if you're if you're in a league where you're stretched thin and you really don't have a quality player to put in there in his place, then you roll with him. But if you've got a, a decent depth or another solid player that you know is going to make make some points for you, I got to put him in the game. Yeah, well, look, let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed for Garrett and my fantasy teams this this weekend because I I definitely need to start him over what I've got behind uh, behind him. So uh, I, I'm hoping you're wrong, John. Um, but for yeah, your I'm sake, not, I hope uh, I'm wrong too. <laughs> 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 um, so the the guy the, here's a guy I, I actually really like. It's uh, it's John Franklin Myers. He's my featured guy this week. He's my edge 45, uh, so a low, a low edge, sort of edge four, I guess, in 12-team leagues. Um, and I picked him out of one of maybe two or three Jets defensive linemen who I could have mentioned here. As I say, it's not that I don't like him. I think he's perennially underrated, actually. He's one of those guys, mm-hmm. one of those very few guys who consistently puts up good pressure numbers and yet fails to uh, to record decent sack totals. Even so, his, his nomination is less about him as a player and more about his opponent. The Dolphins allowed a season-high five sacks last week against the Titans, um, but they were shorthanded on the offensive line, and I think they had two, maybe three guys out. They'll obviously be without um, Connor Williams. He's landed on IR, um, so he'll be out this week and, and for the rest of the season, in fact. Um, but if they can get at least... Armstead back this week. I, I can't imagine they'll be giving up five sacks again, even against a a, a pretty decent pass rush unit like like the Jets. Remember, this is a team that has only allowed 1.8 sacks this year uh, on a per game basis, ranking third in the NFL in that sense. Um, can you name a, a few more guys at a position that you want to avoid this week? Well, so another guy I'm avoiding this week, Brian Burns against the Falcons. Uh, Burns hasn't been the same guy all year that we expected, not the same guy that he was last year. Uh, 2022, he totaled 64 combined tackle, 12 sacks. And he's not going to come close to those numbers this year. Now, he had a big game against Atlanta in week one with a pair of sacks and a forced fumble, but since week five, Burns has two sacks. He hasn't put up more than two solo stops in a game or four combined tackles in any one game. Now he hasn't has scored more than seven fantasy points in a game just once. The Falcons are, are a solid matchup for edge guys, but I don't see Burns being able to take advantage of it. Was, to me, just watching the guy play, a lot of those guys play, it, it seems to me like the, the Panthers are not motivated. Uh, we, whatever's going on there, I mean, it's hard to be motivated when you're one and whatever their record is, 13 at this point. So I can understand somebody not, not being motivated, but when you're making that kind of money, you need to go out and give everything you've got every week regardless. There's a chance that he could, could uh, get back on the uh, good side this week, but uh, this is not the time to take a chance on something like that. Another guy I'm down on this week is DeForest Buckner. Uh, he's a guy that most managers aren't going to be able to bench, and to be honest, I probably won't bench him in my leagues either just because I don't have a good enough player that I can trust to put in there in place of him. Well, it's a very thin position in general, but I do have low expectations for him against the Steelers. Uh, Pittsburgh doesn't give up many tackles to the inside linemen, uh, and they have allowed one sack and one turnover to interior defensive line position in the last two months. Buckner, one of his, one of the things about him, he, he will usually give you good sack or good tackle numbers, and I, I think we'll probably still get three or four tackles out of him. Uh, but he's a guy that is one of the best inside pass rushers in the game with a defensive tackle. And uh, the matchup that this week, I think, would kind of uh, nullify that. I don't see him getting to the quarterback uh, in this game. Yeah, I've got nothing to add. You, you've hit the nail on the head. For me, um, Jonathan Allen is a fade this week. He 
he's not had a bad year, um, but after that excellent sort of 10 sack, 67 pressure season he had two years ago, he's 20, this year, 2023 is his second season in a row where his pressure rate has dipped below 10%. Um, his matchup with the Rams puts me off wanting to start him in week 15 there, tied with Miami for third in the league, allowing only 1.8 sacks this season. Dorrance Armstrong is the second guy I'm looking to bench this week. I mean, I like him in, in best ball leagues where I'm rostering four, maybe five defensive linemen. Um, expecting him to pick up sort of six to eight sacks a season as he tends to do lately. But I don't think this is his week against Josh Allen and co. There, The Bills, are, I think, are tied with the Chiefs for allowing the least sacks per game this year. Uh, and Armstrong still remains third in that. Uh, and what has become a, a pretty deep rotation now, comprising of obviously Parsons, Demarcus Lawrence, Sam Williams, and and others. So yeah, Armstrong for me is is that. Um, you talked about finding guys with a, a good weekly floor. Uh, I feel like Armstrong is the exact opposite of that. He's massively boom or bust. I agree completely on Armstrong. I mean, uh, uh, I think the Bills are giving up. Uh, less of a sack and a half, if I'm not mistaken. It's like 1.3 sacks per game on average since week seven. So they are definitely not a good matchup for your pass rushers. And Armstrong is a guy that is very much dependent on getting to the quarterback. If he doesn't give you a sack, he's not going to give you much of anything. Yeah. Okay, look, so our third and final position group to cover is these uh, these pesky defensive backs. Uh, as always, we'll cover the guys that we like at the position first. So, John, who is your... Your featured player here. Well, my feature, I'm going to chase the numbers this week. You know, Jaquan Brisker had, had the best game of his career, not just the season last week. 13 tackles, four assists, a couple of pass breakups, a forced fumble. Uh, he really blew up. This is a guy last year, looked like he was going to be a stud, looked like he was going to be a top 10 guy for the next decade. This year he came out and the first half of the season, he pretty much was then vanishing it. He was very average at best. Wasn't even a guy that you could really count on to put in your lineup every week. He's kind of starting to turn that around. The big game last week was kind of the culmination of it. Uh, he didn't put up double-digit points in any any game this year uh, until week six. Uh, now he has uh, five of the last six games that he's put up double digits. Yeah, I said, normally I, I'm not somebody that chases the points, but after a game like that, and then you look at the matchup this week against Cleveland. A lot of injuries, backup quarterbacks. The Browns have allowed the second most points to safety since week seven. But I have Brisker as a top five defensive back this week. I only have him in a couple of my leagues that I'm in, but he'll be at my starting line. Yeah, we're in sync because Brisker is also my uh, featured yeah. DB here as well. Um, Great for minds. all the reasons you said, you you stole most of my points. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, but yeah, he. <laughs> You know how can he? How can we not mention him after that that week last week? And it wasn't the first of of, of such a week, was it? He's had, as you said, pretty pretty good tackle rates going back. Um, yes. So at least the last five games, four of his last five games, he's had at least seven tackles. Um, he actually has the yeah. best tackle efficiency of any safety in the league, and his tackle rate is is two point five percent higher than it was last year. And we were all kind of buzzing about what he did last year as well too which you know 2.5 percent may sound very little but if we were to apply that over a you know 1000 snap season we're talking 25 more tackles that's that's a big number yep. the splash plays are there too he's had two sacks a forced fumble an interception and three pass breakups in his last six games i think i think there are safeties who have uh, better matchups this week um, but like you said it's not a bad matchup by any stretch and who's Who's betting against Brisker in the form that he's in, producing uh, again? Um, I'm certainly not. The only thing to watch for, I saw him pop up on the injury report. I think it was a groin strain. That's the only thing to keep an eye on, I think. So let's see if we've picked the same two uh, other defensive backs that we like this week. Um, right. Who who else do you have? So I'm going to, I'm going to throw a bone to managers out there that are in leagues that require corner. Uh, I like DJ Reed this week against the Dolphins. I mean, there are two kinds of corners that offer fantasy value. Those that make a lot of big plays and those who give up a lot of receptions and make a lot of tackles. I mean, Reed falls into that second category. He's not a big play threat, uh, but he has a great matchup with Miami. Uh, 
Dolphins uh, for a long time were the number one uh, matchup for corners. I, still, I think they're still in the top four or five as far as points allowed to the to corners by position. Now you've got Reed playing opposite uh, Sauce Gardner. Well, Gardner will likely draw uh, the main coverage on Hill, I believe, uh, with Hill being banged up. Uh, I mean, most teams will avoid throwing Sauce Gardner's way, which means a trumped up number of options or opportunities for Reed. I think he'll get uh, a lot of targets coming his way. And again, you know, he, he's not a guy that's going to make him a lot of big plays. You can't count on him for an interception or anything like that. But this is a guy that uh, I have him projected to lead the corner position in solo tackles this week. I put, put that out there. So let, that's where I'm at, DJ Reed. Another guy that I like this week, and this is going to be a sleeper, though. Some of you people listening, uh, if you're looking for somebody to take up a slide into your lineup, this might be a guy that's still available. I like Quentin Lake uh, versus Washington. He falls into the sleeper category because he had just won the starting job right before he was injured a few weeks ago, about three weeks ago. Put up good numbers for two games in a row. He had a 60% snap count uh, the one week that he finally got on the field, substantial number. And they had five tackles and an assist and on 42 or so snaps the following week. He was in the starting lineup, seven tackles and an assist. Uh, you know, Washington is a great matchup for the safety position. The running game uh, passes well, throw a lot to the middle of the field. Uh, this, to, if you look at, at the way the, the tackles and so, so forth break down, uh, opponents playing them, the, the safeties make a lot of tackles against Washington. So, Blake, is, he's back to being healthy. He expected to play this week. He's been practicing all week. He will jump back into that starting position, I believe. John Johnson, as a starter last week, had seven tackles in the shifts while playing in the same position. So the position is productive. The player has been productive when he's had the opportunity. He doesn't have a, a long track record for us to look at. Uh, but what we have seen has been good. Uh, the matchup is great. Um, you know, I just It's a situation where a lot of people, there's a lot of injuries this week. If you lost Grant Elpit, uh, if you lost you know, some of the other guys, or a couple other guys on the safeties that, that people had been starting that are banged up, this is a guy that you might be able to pick up and slide in and, and be a good fill-in for you. Yeah, it's interesting that I was going to ask you uh, how um, confident you are that Lake will assume that starting role uh, in place well, of John Johnson again. Because if we I, didn't see it for very long, like you say, he, he won it and then got injured very shortly afterwards. And um, that that kind of just makes me wonder a little. I, I'm not 100% confident, but I'll tell you this. They played three safeties on 71% of the snaps the last time they had three good safeties available. All three of those guys were available, and Johnson was the one that had the 71%. Lake played every snap, and uh, Fuller played every snap. So even if he doesn't play every snap, I expect him to be on the field for 70 to 75% of the snaps, which is still plenty of opportunity that he's not going to give you a goose egg. Well, that's the thing. He he, he may not uh, put up huge tackle numbers. But even if even if I am wrong on that, the guy's going to be on the field enough to be productive. Good list. My list is also pretty decent, even if I do say so myself. Uh, I think there's a lot of things to like about Jalen Thompson this week. He's had at least seven tackles in each of his last three games. He's had a sack and a couple of interceptions over that same period as well. And he's got the 49ers this weekend who have allowed the highest tackle efficiency and the most tackles per game to opposition safeties in 2023. Uh, Sean Jenkins is my other guy. He's he's had a little bump in my rankings this week. He's not a fashionable name. You know, like every DB, he has quiet weeks, but on the whole, he's been fairly consistent, I feel, uh, relative to other safeties. This week, he faces the Ravens. They've allowed the second most tackles to opposition safeties. So I'm kind of suggesting that people just keep rolling with Jenkins as a, a DB2 in, in week 15. I, I can't disagree with any of those. I really like the Ravens as a matchup. We, they like to throw to the tight ends. They've got an outstanding running game. They'll, they'll run between the tackles. They've got the big guys in there. So your safeties get a lot of opportunity and run support there. Jenkins is a guy that he's not been as productive this year is what he was last year, but he has given us some good numbers in certain spots, and I can definitely see this week being one of those spots. Jalen Thompson, I don't know. I, I can't figure out what why he's not putting up the same kind of numbers that he did in the past. He's still playing the same role. Uh, they're still using him 
in the box on a pretty regular basis. He's had some good games, and he's definitely coming on of late. Uh, I like that matchup base. Uh, I like his opportunity this week. Uh, I would agree that, that he's going to be a guy that's definitely going to be a high floor, and he has a pretty high upside as well. San, San Francisco is definitely a solid matchup. But he's another guy that I think a lot of people are kind of sleeping on a little bit. Well, see him show up on the waiver wire in a couple of weeks, surprisingly, uh, up late. It's really a head scratcher for me. As he hasn't been that bad even when he has a down game. So, yeah, I, I like that list. I like those two guys as well. So, look, final section, John. Let's, let's finish strong. Uh, tell us about right. your main EV fade for Week 15. So, my fade this week is uh, Minka Fitzpatrick against the Colts. You know, Fitzpatrick was on fire early in the season. And he missed four games with injuries. He's done very little in the two games since he's come back. Uh, maybe he's not fully recovered. Maybe he's just a little rusty, but he has six total tackles. Uh, I'm sorry, six tackles and four assists over the last two games that he's played combined. Uh, that's not going to help us win any championships unless the numbers come back up. Uh, the key point here, though, is that the Colts are by far the worst matchup in the league for safeties. They're allowing nearly three points per game fewer than the Texans, who rank second. Uh, in, in, like you, you mentioned, it's three points per game doesn't sound like much until you go 16 games, 18 games, and then those numbers kind of tend to add up. A lot of these guys, when you look at overall numbers at the end of the season, the difference between the number one guy and the number 10 guy is usually you know, less than 10 points for the season a lot of times. So, uh, yeah. you know, that might be, a little, might be a little more than that, might be a slight exaggeration, but it's pretty tight that we were seeing guys from one guy to the next. So uh, three points per game fewer than the next team is pretty significant. And that's you know, the Colts' offense, the way the Colts' offense is set up, the short passing game, the runs, and so forth. They're, the linebackers make a boatload of the tackles. The guys just don't get to the safeties. Um, so the safety position is just a horrible matchup for Fitzpatrick. Yeah, again, no no disagreement with uh, with that one. It's, and it, it pains me to admit it because I really like Fitzpatrick as a, as a player. I had him ranked so highly. Um, before that injury, based on what he was doing earlier in the year, and uh, yeah. I, I slotted him straight back into that super high ranking when he came back, and and ever since then he's been he's been falling. Um, he is a he is a threat any week to go off and have a massive week, but yeah, this doesn't look like it against the Colts. And he's a playmaker. You know, he could have one of those interception for a touchdown, and you know, big plays, force a fumble. You know, he could put all that together on one week and win a game for you all by himself. If he doesn't do that, I don't think he's going to help you win your game. No. If you had maybe, if you were 25 points down and uh, Fitzpatrick, you know, you had to choose between two DBs to to, to get yeah. you those points back, maybe yeah. you'd roll with someone like a Fitzpatrick. But, you know, in reality, that's not a, uh, that's not, that's not a scenario you're going to be faced with. So, yeah, I'm with but, you on unless that. Unless you're a major underdog, you can't really afford to do that this week. If you're a real underdog, then you might stretch it a little bit and, and roll the dice with somebody that could could give you that kind of game. I love the player. I had him ranked in my top 10 going into the season. And he was putting up those kind of numbers before the injury. So maybe maybe that'll turn around. But if it wasn't for the matchup, I wouldn't be nearly as far down on him as I am this week. But uh, he's got to overcome every – too much to overcome this week. The matchup is a real killer. And it's been getting worse lately for safeties versus the Colts yep. as well. Let's talk about these these – these other guys at the defensive back position that we that we don't like this week. Who who else do you have? You got two names for me, John. I got Jonathan Owens against the Tampa Bay. Uh, Owens moved into the starting lineup when Rudy Ford was injured a few weeks back. He played so well that when Ford returned two weeks ago, uh, Ford went back to a backup role. So Owens is staying on the field. Now uh, Owens gave us double digit points in four straight games, including a huge Week Twelve, and he's fallen off with a pair of really weak matchups in the last two games. Uh, the big thing here is the Buccaneers have allowed fewer than 10 combined tackles per game to the safety position as a whole over the last two months. Uh, that's just not – it's hard to overcome a lack of tackles from the safety position. Owens is a guy that has the potential to give us a big play in there. Uh, and with the right matchup, he's a guy that would, I'd, be, I'd have him on the other end of the list as a guy that you have to start the matchup rules on this one for me, um, especially coming up with to a guy coming off of a game where he had two solo tackles and nothing else last week. Uh, Nate Hobbs is the other guy that I, I'm looking at uh, set out this week. 
against the Chargers. You know, if this was two weeks ago, the Chargers were a great matchup. Well, it was uh, Justin Herbert on the sideline. We've got a backup quarterback in there that we don't know anything about. Uh, we really don't expect a whole lot of offense. The offense was struggling even with their starting quarterback in. Uh, I just I see them trying to turn to more of a run game. I, I think we're looking, like I mentioned, uh, somebody else I was talking about earlier that was in this matchup. It, I think we might be looking at another one of those low scoring slug thefts where you know it's a ten to seven game or seven to six game or something like that, you know, with, without a whole lot of offense and without a whole lot of passing. Hobbs is as much like DJ Reed in that he is another one of those corners that gives up a lot of receptions and then makes a whole lot of tackles, but isn't going to give you any big plays either. Although without a whole lot of passing, there's obviously not going to be a whole lot of receptions to have, so there's not going to be many tackles to be made. Yeah, so I'll I'll round out your list um, by talking about two good players, actually, that I'm fading this week. Javon Holland is my first nomination, unlike how he started the year, uh, in a fantasy sense at least. Um, but those tackle numbers have started to fall away a bit after that first month, and Outside of that one game um, against a team, I forget who it was, when he had three forced fumbles, the big plays just haven't been there for him outside of that one game. So, you know, obviously he's missed the last few games and he's optimistic about playing this week. But even if he does, will he be, will he be back to speed? Um, will he be on a snap count? Again, I like him as a player. I really like him as a player, in fact. Um, but he hasn't produced well enough, even when healthy, to, to make him undroppable especially in a week when we're not 100% sure if he's going to be fully healthy. So fading Holland. Javarius Ward is my next and final guy. Um, I could make a very similar argument um, in his case as I did in Holland's case. Very good player. Um, the difference here, of course, is that Ward's been one of the better fantasy producers at his position. His tackle numbers are down, but he leads all cornerbacks with 16 pass breakups. So as long as you score those in your league, he's... He's right up there with with the best of them. As with Holland, though, my concern is will will Ward be uh, fully back uh, and at full speed? Apparently, he has a chance to practice later in the week. That's that doesn't sound uh, anywhere near reassuring, as far as I'm concerned. And so do we again want to gamble? <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, do we want to gamble uh, on on a guy like this at this point in the season? I'm not sure we do. And obviously, Kyler Murray's been pretty. I'm uh, pretty careful with the ball since he came back a month ago. And of course, you know, if you need another reason, uh, the Cardinals allow very few tackles to opposition corners. So, yeah, it's a big fade for me on Ward as well. And I'm with you on that one. I'm definitely with you on Javon Holland as well. I think the biggest issue with Holland is that he's, he usually plays that deep safety role, so he's going to be very inconsistent. Uh, he is a big play threat. He's one of the, he's, he's much like Lincoln Fitzpatrick in the He's very capable at any given time having a go-off game where you can win the game single-handedly for you. But if you don't get that game at the right time, he's also just as likely to give you real close to a donut, too. Yeah. That, that's that's kind of inherent of the position that he plays when we play that deep safety role. And, uh, and basically, you're covering for anybody else's mistakes that happens in front of you. So. And I talked about him as one of those guys who, you know, we, we, we've actually seen him play a little more in the box this year. All the ratio yes, yeah. between box and, and and deep roll being being a little yeah. a little healthier this year, um, yeah. but that's that that's you know that's matchup dependent, game script dependent. Um, you know when they could, the Dolphins are up by a huge amount, they they just sit back there and wait for passes all day long. Then then why wouldn't they play him in that deeper role? But he's he's a fade for me this week, especially against a Jets offense that can't throw the ball more than ten yards. <laughs> Yeah, again, we're we're hoping for big plays from someone like a Holland this week, which is yep. not a situation that I feel comfortable going into a game hoping for. I want I want to know a guy's going to get me, you know, seven, eight tackles at the position would be wonderful. And if if he manages to get a pass breakup or any other sort of big type of play, then then that's wonderful. That's as you as you mentioned earlier on the icing on the cake, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. All right, so that's that's a wrap, John. Uh, we hope. Rick. This has been useful to to anyone kind enough to check out the the show. John, you've uh, you've aced it. Thanks for coming on and sharing your thoughts with us all. Hope you've had a good time. Oh, absolutely. I've enjoyed it. Bring me up again sometime. We'll do it again. I will do. I will do. I, I said to you uh, off air before we started, one of the best things about 
this gig is getting to talk to all of these kick-ass guests uh, that I've been following for a time. It doesn't get any better than that. So I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed tonight. Uh, please, would you be so kind as to share with our audience where they can find you and your fantasy content? So I'm the uh, head staff writer for IDP content at Football Guys, kind of what we call the crew chief uh, over that side of the game. I uh, have uh, several good writers there, but uh, you can find all of my stuff at footballguys.com. Uh, I do uh, projections each week. I have a column, uh, Eyes of the Guru, that usually comes out on Wednesday at early afternoon, evening, try to get an out in time for everybody to, to do their waiver moves and so forth for the week. Uh, I do a piece with uh, the godfather of IDP, uh, Gary Davenport, who most everybody that plays IDP knows. Gary and I go way back, uh, actually, uh, I started writing fantasy football in, in, in 1994 was when I started writing about defensive players. So I've been at this for a little bit. And Gary was kind of one of my protégés uh, that kind of came in with me and a couple other guys. There were only a couple of us doing it at the time. So he kind of picked it up from there and has become a big part of the industry and a great guy to work with, uh, very knowledgeable as well. So footballguys.com. Cool. Yep. We we know all about them here. Uh, we, we love your – uh, you know the Joey's, the Kyles. We've had Gary on the show, so it's uh, it's nice to complete complete that picture and, uh, and have you on tonight, John. Um, Thank you, uh, audience. If you want to follow me, you can find me on X at Jace Abbey. My weekly rankings are over on uh, our site at theidpshow.com. As always, thanks for tuning in. Good luck in those fantasy playoffs. I'll be back for more of the same in week sixteen. Feel weird to say week sixteen already. Bye for now. And now it's time to go, cause you about to roll with the IDP show.